Hello, everyone, and welcome to Freehands Friday number 28. My name is Russell Keating, and today our guest is Elliot McCann, and Dale Latisseur is going to be interviewing Elliot, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to it because uh, I was looking for information on Elliot online and really didn't come up with a whole lot of stuff, and then I realized that he's a relatively new stick player, um, so it'll be interesting for people that are just learning the instrument played for a while to look back and relate to some of the things we went through when we were learning it too. So lots more stuff also. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to Dale and have you on it, Dale. How about her? You sound like a Canadian. Um, hello. It's a, it's a joy to be here and uh, with my with my new, new stick brother, Elliot, um, who I've gotten to meet over uh, the lovely social media um, uh, element of Facebook. Um, Elliot came to my attention when he started uh, remarking wittily on different stick players that I knew. Um, and I thought, well, who is this person? And so I went and checked it out and uh, saw a person that um, definitely had a passion for um, the stick and, and for music, uh, one of, of, of um, strong opinion, which I always think is a, a wonderful thing. And uh, someone that uh, lived in Australia, and I thought, well, you know, it's about time we heard from Down Under. So welcome, Elliot, to Freehand. Thank you very much, Dale. It's really lovely to be here. Hello, everybody. So just a, a quick sight gag to start us off. Since you're in Australia, do you have to play the stick like this? <laughs> I think it helps if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm being a brat. Um, yeah, so uh, so you are not you are living in Australia, but you are not born there. You were born in the UK, and then you uh, moved to Australia when you were five. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, yeah. We came over uh, when I was five in 1977, uh, just before Thatcher got into power in England. So it was really, really good timing from my parents' point of view. Uh, I thought they <laughs> sort of think that they saw the writing on the wall and thought, let's let's go to somewhere it's sunny and the opportunities are better. So uh, yeah, we spent one month on a boat coming over. So um, yeah, we went through the uh, Suez Canal, down the Mediterranean Ocean and into the uh, the Indian Ocean. So you know, it was a uh, quite a trip for a five-year-old. That's very cool. And you remember a lot of it. Uh, I, I remember the actual the journey, and every now and again, it's like you get a smell of lead-lined paint, which reminded me of the boat. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I certainly. I mean, one of the places that we stopped off at was in it was in Port Said in Egypt, and we sort of stayed there for about four days. Did the whole Valley of the Kings tour, looked at pyramids. I slid down a pyramid when I was five, so hence my interest in Egyptology, which explains that little thing there. So, because people often ask, why are you wearing that? Well, what, what's that all about? So, it's because I went to Egypt when I was five. It's one place I'd like to return to, but when it's possibly a little more um, calm and <laughs> collected as opposed to right now. Right. Now, you said uh, when you uh, sent me your bio, you said that your uh, parents have very different personalities. Um, uh, do you uh, you want to get into that? And um, was there uh, an element of music very early on in your childhood? There was. It's funny. A lot of people sometimes ask me, you know, "Did you come from a musical household?" And usually, what they mean is like, you know, "What instruments do your parents play?" Uh, my parents uh, not only have sort of very different personalities. Obviously, they're similar in some, some respects, but they came from two completely different backgrounds as well. My mum came from sort of like a what you would call the middle class background in England and uh, my dad came from a working class background. Um, my mother had uh, piano lessons when she was 14 and sort of I had piano inflicted upon her so like if you play the wrong note you got your fingers whacked with a ruler and there's no better way to kill interest in an instrument than to do that to a child and dad simply never had the opportunity but what they both had was a shared love and um, deep appreciation of music so when I was a kid, there was always music around the household. So you you always have the record players on, and um, even in my teen years, I remember that you know time was always made for music um, in the house. So like the television would be turned off at a certain point in time, the record player would go on or the um, the, the CD player would go on, and you'd spend the next hour listening to 
whatever anybody chose. So music was always made um, a priority in that regard. So in that sense, yes, I did come from a musical household because music was always all around. Excellent. And uh, your first instrument was the violin, is that right? The violin, yes. Um, yeah, that was um, an odd choice. I think it's because it was portable and affordable um, at the time. So I didn't really know that I was going to be told that I was going to play violin, but yeah, all of a sudden I found myself in a music shop being given a violin. Here, play this. So um, ironically, at a music shop, which you know, about 30 years later I worked at, so it was me in about you know, 30 years down the track doing exactly the same thing to little kids that I had done to me you know, ages ago. It's bizarre. So I sort of stand on that spot and go, I was here before. This feels familiar. So it's um, <laughs> unusual. But yeah, so I, I did that, but I found it very difficult to play because it, I found it an uncomfortable instrument. And, um, and I, I, to this day, I respect anybody who can actually get a decent tune out of the thing because it's... It just looks uncomfortable. You can't see what you're doing. Your hands in a weird position. Um, you have no frets, so you you have to be your intonation has to be absolutely exact. And <laughs> excuse me, we used to have this um, Yorkshire Terrier dog, tiny little thing, about as big as that. Um, really small little cute dog. And most animals, when they hear something they don't like, they run screaming from the room. This dog would come, sit down in front of me, in front of the music stand, and howl at me as I was practicing, as if to say, you're really rubbish at this, just stop. So um, that was you know, another disincentive. Wow. When the dog's in, uh, a critic, you know that, that, that something's going on. So what made you uh, move to, uh, to the piano? Um, precious child, I suppose. Uh, I, th I think there was. Um, I, th I, think, I think my folks recognised that there was probably more opportunity to actually <laughs> play in tune, and um, <laughs> and, and uh, studies because what it immediately taught me was um, how to play with my uh, sort of my left hand and right hand together, which was very handy. It also taught me the bass clef, and really helped my um, theory as far as harmony and. Um, so construction, chord construction was concerned, which came into really handy when it came to looking at going to the guitar and also the stick as well. Is sort of having that divided, um, uh, sort of you know, having your, your hands divided in that manner of like one does one thing, the other does the other. Um, felt, felt very comfortable because I'd had the experience with piano. Right. Ooh, excuse right. me. Now, yeah, um, get more comfortable. How about that? There we go. Yeah, it's very important that you're comfortable. Yes, yeah, that's this, much better. This, will, this won't hurt as much. <laughs> um, so, so uh, you started singing at an early age too. You have a, a long, long history of being in choral groups and choirs. Um, do you yeah. do you still sing? Um, not as much, um, actually. How can I put this nicely? I don't really enjoy singing, but I'll do it if I have to. Um, and particularly the, um, the the repertoire that you know, we're doing now. I mean, for instance, last night we had a band rehearsal. Oops, hello. Come on. There you are. Yeah, last night we had a band rehearsal, and we were sort of debating about you know who gets to sing what and all that sort of thing. And uh, it's like <laughs> the inevitability of like, oh, you better start thinking that you're going to start singing soon. A lot of it's... Um, Everyone sort of says, oh, you've got a really good voice and all that sort of stuff, which is, you know, flattery will get them everywhere. But the other side of the thing is that I don't actually enjoy the noise I make because <laughs> I keep sort of thinking, I don't sound like all my favourite singers, so therefore I don't really like it. So, um, yeah, I mean, especially with a voice like this at the moment, it's a bit dodgy. Excuse this, it's, it's like the, um, first of all, it's three o'clock in the morning over here, and right. um, I'm just getting over getting getting head cold. So that's why I sound so croaky and a bit you know, gravelly. I, I usually sound a lot better than this. <laughs> but um, that, that's why I didn't do any singing last night. It's like, oh, I don't know. Like, you know, I don't think I can hold a tune with two hands at the moment, let alone you know, one voice. So um, yeah, it's um, I I don't sing as much. I think also I probably got a little bit bored of it because I had done so much in the past as well. So I'm always looking for a new challenge. Yeah. So at uh, 14, you uh, you uh, came across the concept of the Chapman stick. You want to just walk us through that? Yes, it was odd. At the, um, at the time when I was 14, I started to you know, 
do the usual you know, teenage boy thing of like pick up a guitar and try and play it. And um, when I came back from music camp one day, my dad bought um, he, he bought me a copy of Guitar Player magazine. It was the um, June 1986 edition. It had the Synfax on the cover. I don't know if you remember the Synfax, this bizarre MIDI controller which looked like a space age club. So that was on the cover of the magazine, and I got really intrigued by that. Started reading all about you know, all the different players that were you know, using synthesizers and things as their guitar in their guitar playing. But I think it was the the edition a couple of weeks, or sorry, a couple of months later than that. <coughs> excuse me, where um, I think it was the one with Steve Vai was on the cover for the very, very, very first time, and in there was an interview with Adrian Ballou, and I'm pretty certain in that interview that's where he mentioned the Chapman stick. And of course, it just says Chapman stick. Now, this is the kids. This is the day before the internet. This is the days before Google, so you couldn't just type stuff in and say, "What is a Chapman stick?" You have to go to the library, the, these archaic buildings that no longer exist where books were held. You have to go to there and have a look and sort of see what is a Chapman stick. And he'd ask people, "Ever heard of a Chapman stick? What are you talking about?" Um, so, for a long time, I didn't. I, I knew that a Chapman stick existed, but I never knew what it was until I saw a photo of one, and then I was immediately intrigued because it was, I couldn't understand how it possibly worked. It was, there was too many strings. There was not enough body. As you know. It looks like it's strangling you when you wear it. Um, and then, I th so from that point, I was like, well, that's really, really odd. There must be strange people who play that instrument. And it wasn't until I, th I can't remember the track. Yes, I know, yeah, guilty. <laughs> um, I can't remember the, what track it was, but it was bound to be something off um, one of Peter Gabriel's albums. I can't remember it. So hence, Tony Levin was playing it. And I just heard this really, you know, bizarre sound and thought, what's that? And then I read the line and it's Chapman stick or stick. And from that point it was like, oh, okay. And you just, because Australia is Australia, you didn't see it very often. Uh, the only instance I remember seeing was, um, there's a band over here um, in the 80s called Midnight Oil. Oh, yeah. Quite a, well, you know, good. Oh, yes. To become a, a member of parliament and was frankly not very good at it. But they had a footage of a live concert that they played on um, outside Sydney Harbour, and the bass player played Stick on one of the tracks in 1985, I think it was. And I was reminded of this a few months back and saw the footage. Oh, that's right. I remember seeing this on the telly and wondering, what the hell is that thing? And of course, it was a Chapman stick that he was playing. So um, I've always been intrigued by the stick from that point onwards. Okay, so it, uh, it took you some I've time to uh, Pardon me? <coughs> it, it took you some time to uh, get your hands on one. Um, uh, between, then yes. and, <laughs> between then and now, uh, you spent a great deal of time uh, as a bassist, is that right? Uh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I love the way, I love the way you put it in your... I love the way you put it in your uh, in your uh, in your bio. It was told by the drummer to pick up the bass, uh, and then you know, and you you were reluctant, but then you fell in love with the instrument, and the crowd went mild. And I like that line. <laughs> it's true. Yes, uh, overnight success was not exactly overnight. So um, it, it took a fair bit of work, and I was absolutely you know, convinced that I wanted to be a guitar player when I grew up. And sort of getting told to play bass was, it seemed like a bit of a relegation at the time. <laughs> but it actually, by a really rubbish guitar licks that I would learn, it sounded really cool on the bass. And it's like, it made me sound better than I actually was. So I started sort of showing off of being a guitar player on a lower instrument playing bass. And then sort of people say, look, you play too much. Just play bass, you know, just be sensible about this. So um, in the end, I did. Um, and it's sort of, he wants to be a bass player. So if you tell people, oh, I play bass, all of a sudden you're in every band you know because those guitars are, you know, guitarists are, you know, a dime a dozen. Bass players are a little rarer. Uh, they're a little more thin on the ground. So if uh, that's what I've been telling my eldest. It's like, you know, make sure you play bass because everybody will want you in their band. Everybody needs a bass player. Right. Exactly. Um, the um, 
the the time that uh, it took you to get uh, a chat mistake, I mean, you had to at some point have thought, you know what, I'm just going to go for it and dive in. Um, do you want to walk us through that that moment where you actually decided to dive in? Yeah, I I had decided to myself uh, about ten years ago that yeah, I want to give this a go, um, you know, see if I can actually make this work. <coughs> I was working at a a really terrific music shop here in Perth, and everybody that had been working there prior to me being there knew what a Chapman stick was because, um, like, the boss would go to the damn conferences in America and talk about um, getting instruments in. He's actually, um, I think I'm right in saying this, and I won't be sort of breaking any confidences. The guy that ran this particular shop, who shall remain nameless because, you know, uh, he was actually responsible for bringing Martin guitars into Australia originally in the late late 60s, early 70s, because he'd always wanted a Dreadnought uh, D28, uh, couldn't get one, so he actually started to import them. So that's how the shop started, uh, or that's part of the reason why the shop started. So he'd go over to them and he sort of, you know, went one year and said, is there anything that we need that I can probably talk to while we're over it now? And I just immediately said, yeah, Chapman sticks. And he looked at me and said, right, what should I get then? I said, uh, oh, okay, uh, a 10 string and a 12 string. You know, I don't know, we'll just, just get a chapter stick. And he was actually, he didn't reject the idea out of hand. And I thought, this is interesting, you know, well, maybe he's actually going to get a chapter stick. This would be good. So he goes away. And the, my colleague is sort of saying, yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, you of all people, you really need to get your hands on a chapter stick. You know, yeah, the, the way that you <laughs> think, you, know, you need a chapter stick. <laughs> unbeknownst, yeah, unbeknownst to me, five minutes later, my parents walked down the stairs. Yeah, they're in the neighbourhood. They've come in to say hello. So I don't see them, but this other guy does. He says, oh, hello, you know, can I help you? My mother, because she's got a great sense of humour, turns and goes, oh, oh, yes, do you have any Chapman sticks? At which point this guy looks at me as if to go, excuse me? <laughs> do you know these people? He's like, yeah, those are my parents. They've got a good sense of humour. Uh, <laughs> so we never actually got one. Well, they never actually brought them in, unfortunately. Um, but... Uh, it was still in the back of my mind. Yes, I have to get my have to get my hands on one. This so was about ten years ago. Yeah, this was about ten years ago. So for about a decade, I've been going. I really wouldn't mind getting a Chapman stick, you know. Or how am I going to get a Chapman stick? Or have I got the money to order a Chapman stick? And I was very nearly was going to order one, and uh, then I found Claymore on a certain uh, auction site on the internet, which shall remain nameless, and. Um, Put a bid in and fortunately won it two days after my birthday. So it's like, yay! Happy birthday to me. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's let's meet Claymore, shall we? Okay. Right, Claymore, come here. There we are. Come here. This is it. This is Claymore. He's a polycarbonate from. Uh, I'm assuming probably around about 1987. It's a flat just based top. on the serial number and see what. It is. Yep, flat top. Then here come old flat top. Here comes grooving up slowly. Um, here serial number is one double nine one. It makes buzzing noises when I do that, which I probably shouldn't do. Um, very one of the things that I've, um, I think this is a very good instrument to get as a beginner because there's not too much here to confuse you other than the strings. <laughs> So it's um, control-wise, it's very simple. It's just got you know, bass and melody side volumes, uh, plug, uh, just these wonderful little uh, knurled things to uh, hold the strings. There's the string holders. There's no intonation, none of that. It's as bad as I hesitate to use the word primitive, but it is very, very simple and stripped down. And um, yeah. I think that was a, a good thing because it meant I could just concentrate on the actual getting used to the instrument. Yeah. Well and then, oh, the, the one thing, is that gone? Well said. Yeah, it's, uh, sometimes you get a little intimidated with, oh, what does this do? Oh, you know, should I touch that? You know, all that sort of thing. This was just, you know, all you need to concentrate now is the strings. And so is it standard tuning? <coughs> I think I've got, yes, I have got it in matched reciprocal. Okay. which I chose to go from from the day one because it just seemed to make sense for me to have notes that were sort of... Sort of 
that were matching sort of across the fret. So if I do this at the uh, seventh fret, it sort of helped me learn where the notes were, as opposed to having it. I think it's down. A, I think the other way is to have it down a Top semitone or a down a tone. Yeah, yeah semitone is the standard. So. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that just sort of seemed like that is just going to confuse me any further. One thing I should show you um, about this, which necessitated the need for Colossus to come into the picture, is I don't know if you can see. Yes, you can. Um, this very interesting instrument, which um, was you know, rare to find in Australia, because this was actually found, this was actually purchased from a guy in Adelaide, which is the next capital city over from Perth right. in South Australia. Yeah, you're talking about um, a Canadian who yeah. actually knows her geography, not not like uh, Russell over here. Bizarre. Okay, that's good. Excellent. <laughs> I'm glad about that. We probably know more about Australian geography than we know about Canadian geography. However, I am. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, right, okay, cool. Um, I went to the Crimson Project um, concert and got it autographed. So it's now become priceless. Uh, I've got, uh, we'll do it this way. Oops, hello. Uh, we start with Adrian Ballou, uh, Tobias Ralph, Julie Slick, Pat Mastolotto, Marcus Reuter, and Tony Levin. So. Nice. Getting their autographs on this, it sort of meant I don't really want to take this to gigs anymore. I'd like it's a museum to piece. Keep this in the studio. Yeah, so I can break this out and show it off like I've just done. So I needed to get, um, well, well, I wanted to get a, a second stick, and that's when Scott Neville was very, very kind enough to sell me his rail board that he had because um, he was, I think he really wanted a 12 string rail board if they existed. And um, so I've, I managed to get that one, and that's the one that. I intend to use for gigging purposes only because it's um, much lighter, um, a little more adjustable, of course, because of you know, the way it is. <coughs> it's much more. I've, the difference I've found between, say, um, Claymore and Colossus is that Colossus is far more comfortable to play, even though it weighs more. Now I wasn't really looking. I wasn't looking for that. Um, I wanted something lighter, but it's you know, bizarre. Colossus just seems to. Have a bit more heft to it. Either that, or I've just gotten used to how much Claymore weighs, because that was one of the, the reason why it's called Claymore is because it weighs about as much as a Claymore, and it's a two-handed weapon, so that's why I got named that. Um, and then when Colossus came along, it was just like the bigger, better version of Claymore, like the um, the added distance between the nut and the first fret note was just it really took a, a lot of dealing with. And, um, but the actual feel of how to play it was um, it's so interesting. I'm still still trying to get used to it. It's they're two totally different animals, um, and I love them both. And they also have a different sound. Um, the it's like probably going from an active bass to a passive bass is the difference in sound. Like this would be the passive bass sound, nice sort of warm yeah. round, does one thing, uh, whereas the rail board. Even before you start getting into all the little gadgetry it does about with the mid-range shiftings, um, immediately the first thing you do on this sort of neutral setting, it's a much brighter, you know, in-your-face sort of sound. It's good to have both, actually. I think uh, once I, once I get it up, right, get get it running and get it all working to its best possible way, um, I think it'd be very handy to have both sticks. And how how cool would it look? Not only just to bust out one stick, but to have two. Oh. Gosh, it looks just fantastic on stage. So there's that as well. Is the rail board a match reciprocal as well? Yes, it is. Yeah, um, so that I don't get confused. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, why don't you uh, play us something? A little ditty of some sort. Okay, um, I'll give something a bit of a bash. Um, hopefully, we won't get you know, knocks on the door. Uh, so. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Um, if this is some, something that I'm working on for the band that I'm that just had rehearsal with, a group called Magnolia Jones, and um, it's something that I came up with, which is sort of very simple to play on um, on the stick, but just seemed to work and seemed to sound like it'd be a good um, thing to have as a. Um, I'll just turn it down a bit. It, it, yeah, it just sounded like a, a nice little piece to have to build a song on. So hopefully. If I stand over here, you'll get to see what I'm doing. Uh, this here, excuse me. Yeah. 
Oh, you can't. All you can see is. No, you don't want that. God. <laughs> um, there you can't see anything because you've got lens. It's a JJ Abrams film. Check it out. All right. um, there we are. All right. Well, don't come back here. <laughs> there we are. Are we organised now? Who knows? That's perfect. Except for that bit. There we are. You know, you can, if you get bored, you can read the future under cover. Hang on. <laughs> Jeez, I'm really restraining myself with the comments right now. I just want you to know. Oh, that's good. All right, now. And then swim, and then swim. Oh, gee, great. Whose idea was this? We apologize for this break in transmission. <laughs> right, let's try this. All right. How's that sound? Yeah, uh, yeah that sounds good. Just step back uh, one step. There you go. Yeah. I was going to say, it's sort of, that's, at, the, at this moment, it's kind of the limit of my abilities. <laughs> well, that seems to, uh, it seems to all work. Well, that seems to work. Yeah, it's um, something I just want to sort of develop. There will be a melody that will go over the top of that one, so I've actually nailed down what the lyrics are going to be. And um, we'll just take it from there. There's uh, other things that I've done with the group as well which aren't as um, demonstrative, they're probably more strictly bass on stick at present. So, But that was just a, a case of taking an existing song and um, trying to play it on the instrument, whereas this one I've just done has been written deliberately with the stick in mind. Right, right. Now you had, uh, you had posted a really cool little riff uh, uh, a while ago. Um, have you done anything since with that? Because it was seriously cool. Uh, was that the um, the Michael Hedges ripoff that I did? <laughs> there was one which was very. Hey, well, listen, it, Peter very Gabriel says Hedges. music is based on theft, so if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, yeah, steal from the good. That the. Uh... But the short answer is no. I haven't done anything with it. <laughs> That one? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't done anything with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that that shape that I've used with the bass and the octave um, ninth chords, which was, uh, where are we? That has been transplanted so that I can then use it for the next the thing that I've just done prior to that, the one that's in A. And it's a very, for me, that's a very comfortable shape mm -hmm. to have. So you've got your bass on the little finger, on the pinky, and then your index finger barring that chord, which can then either go minor or major. Nice. So that's almost like a default position for me to be in, which can then sort of be used for other stuff on the um, treble side. Finding it, um, I wouldn't say it's difficult getting into, um, involved getting the treble side involved, but it's um, the new challenge that the hard thing I found, and you'll probably see this on some of the uh, things that I've posted on the Facebook, is um, once you start bringing your right hand in, the discipline is then to keep the left hand steady so that it doesn't race, doesn't get out of rhythm. So that sort of thing is 
one of the, there was one thing I posted called running before I can crawl, and that was sort of very similar. It's like, yeah, look what I can do. I can sort of, oh, geez, no, it's all gone to pear, it's gone pear shape on me. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's the crux of a, the biscuit. Yes, indeed. It is uh, one hell of an apostrophe. Right. <coughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, it's, when, when you, because uh, because you have a lot of musical uh, knowledge, uh, just I'm, I'm just assuming this with violin, piano, guitar, bass, and choral um, background. Uh, do you find that when you pick up the stick, when you have uh, some free time with it, where you don't have to practice uh, anything specific, and it's just a creative time for you, um, do yeah. you find that you approach it from your left brain analytical theoretical side, or or are you more just making sounds and Catching what you dig. It's probably more right. For, you know, the the second case, if that's right brain activity of just you know, make a noise on the thing, that's definitely the way I approach it. Um, I did sort of go through the free hands book when it first came and sort of try to approach it, and that was instructive because it, you know, it at least gave me some grounding on what it does. But then it was the case of like, let's just have fun. What what can I do? What's, so. If I, if I was to go back and look at you know, my play as, composed, as compared to what's in the, uh, in the, in the manual, it would probably be two completely different things. But uh, I actually do, yeah, do enjoy just you know, making a, a silly noise on the thing sometimes. So particularly if you get a looping pedal or something like that involved, you can just like set something up and try and work things over. And again, there was a... What's the... <laughs> Stuff like that. I've no idea what that was, but just working off that, off the base of that, right. which again is probably reflective of my guitar background as well. Um, but yeah, bringing in those other chords as well. Um, it's all that's all just been done from what I like to call noodling. Just you know, pick the thing up and make a noise, and um, then so I mean, when it then comes the discipline comes in of hearing something that you like and then being able to repeat that and remember it and then use it later. And sometimes he's like, oh, that's a really good riff, that. I'll remember that. You go to sleep, wake up and go, now what was that riff? <laughs> oh, I can't remember. So then you, you have to start again and find other things. So that can okay. be frustrating at times. But um, but certainly, yeah, yeah. I, th um, I think having the background, there was one of these um, State of the Sticks last year, um, Kevin Keith said something which really resonated with me, that he said it helps to be... Um, it's, a music, it's an instrument for a mature musician, as far as if you come to it with having um, a good solid background in music theory or um, you know, just knowledge, you'll get a lot out of it. And that's, I mean, it's certainly the stick has come along at exactly the right time for me, for that point of view, because I was starting to honestly get a little bored with bass. Right. It sort of, it sort of, I've reached the, not so much the limit of what I could do, because you can always get better, but... I'd reached sort of like a, a plateau of what I was being asked to do on the instrument, and I wasn't being asked to, you know, take it any further. So it's like, okay, this is all fine and good, but I need something more. And that's when the stick arrived. It's like, oh, yes, I've got so, I've got six more strings than I had before. So what do I do with these? <laughs> um, and so, so um, it's just been a case of finding out. It's been great. Um, do you uh, do you uh, find yourself? Uh, I mean, like, yeah, you have a, a broader palette of sound to write on now. Do you find yourself tackling, well, I'm sure that you probably find yourself tackling more ambitious, uh, not in, or only rhythmically ambitious uh, pieces, but uh, more broad in, in, uh, in melodic scope. Um, that question, the second part of that is, <coughs> do you ever um, uh, try and go with uh, writing lyrics once you, uh, when you're jamming? Um, I try to leave the uh, the lyric writing side of things completely separate and just usually focus. I'm one of these terrible people that doesn't really listen to the lyrics of songs because I'm oh, too interested terrible. in the music. Yeah, awful person. I mean, there's you know there are notable exceptions. I was having this discussion with the band members yesterday. Yeah, this is uncanny. And they said, you know, there's people like um, Warren Zevon, for instance, um, whose lyrics just you know stand out as you know. First of all, they're so unusual that they just grab you. Um, 
there's, I mean, um, Paul Simon would be another one. Is sort of the when he's not trying to fit as many syllables as he possibly can in a line. He's you know, a lot of the lyrics uh, have a good stark imagery that you sort of grab you. But generally speaking, because um, the music background and all of that sort of thing, it's like, oh, that's a nice A major seventh chord he played there. Is it going to resolve to the F sharp seven? Yes, it does. So I start listening to music like that, sort of trying to figure out chords. And um, so most of my folks is to music, and I will, I will leave lyric writing, such as mine is, separately, and then try and wedge that into the music. Very rarely do um, lyrics and music come together. When they do, it's you know you grab, you pull a car over, grab a piece of paper, and just scrawl because um, it, when both you know melody and lyrics happen at the same time, there's a song I'm working on which isn't on a stick. Um, just recently, and a verse just came fully formed, and I just had to stop what I was doing, get over, and write it down because wow. I knew that you know if, if I miss that you know little bolt of lightning, it'll, it'll be gone. So that that's uh, that's a gift, again. and that's very rare. Yeah, no, I was just saying that's a gift, and that's really rare. And I'm glad that you stopped and uh, and wrote it down quickly because those things will pass through you faster than well. And <laughs> anyway, um. Uh, that that's brilliant. The, the original part of the question was, um, do you uh, find yourself writing in uh, more uh, complex uh, rhythms and more broader melodic structures? Um, I don't at the moment, and that's just simply a reflection on the fact that I've only had it for three months, but I certainly will. Um, I found a whole bunch of um, recordings of things that I'd recorded when I first got my sequence of keyboard when I was got uh, 22 and it's, it's, it's quite instructive to sort of listen to that stuff 20 years later and first of all you can hear who you're ripping off you can tell you know um, oh he was listening to Shostakovich and Frank Zappa and all these other people because of, oh that's exactly what this sounds like but I was deliberately getting as difficult and arduous and strange as I possibly could um, because I was learning how to figure out the machine I haven't quite reached that stage with the stick just yet I don't know if my taste has changed, possibly, but the uh, it's it's really at the moment. Once I get to a point where um, I have a de decent enough facility, I would imagine that certainly harmonically, the music's going to get a lot more interesting. Uh, rhythmically, possibly, but I think certainly harmonically is going to be the first thing that will stretch. Rhythmically, I think I've got enough going on. Uh, just you know, making a sound out of the instrument, then sort of like thinking what to do. But I can certainly see um, because of the uh, uh, the nature of the, the beast that yeah, you could have say one hand doing one time, another hand doing another time. So you can have four versus three, or yeah, you know, four versus six. Um, there's a, a guy. I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a drummer called Virgil Donati. He's an Australian drummer. At the moment, he's on tour with Alan Holdsworth. Oh, nice. The guy is a, a phenomenal, phenomenal musician. He had a band called On The Verge, and there was one song that we covered in the band years ago called Pyramids On Mars, and it's in 2116. And the only reason we worked out it was 2116 is because one hand was doing seven groups of three, so one, two, three, two, two, three, two, three, two, three, three, three da, 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 over the top of that, another... And the other hand was doing three groups of seven. So ba 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 da 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 da. That's the sort of thing I can see doing on the stick because you have the facility to do that. You can do it harmonically and rhythmically at the same time. So that's uh, it's a work in progress. But that sort of complexity, um, the stick certainly it lends itself to that sort of level of complexity. But first of all, yeah, running before we can crawl. Let's not get too excited. Let's just actually make sure that one can play the instrument to begin with. Now, uh, just to clarify, um, when did you get Claymore? I uh, got Claymore on the 23rd of May this year. Okay, you know what? I um, I was under the impression that you've been playing for three years and not three months, so I'm extremely impressed with what you've already accomplished on the instrument and can't Yes, it's only, it's only been recently. That's hilarious. Uh, well, you know, kudos to you accepting taking up um, uh, 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 some time with us on Freehands <coughs> Friday. Um, uh, so then, 
it's it, yeah, it blows my mind. It's some. Uh, there was a guy on uh, that that was on the Free Hands uh, Academy uh, a few weeks back named Andy uh, Prokopic. Uh, forgive me, Andy, for for yes. uh, misspelling your your last name. And he had only been playing for ten months, and he'd been doing some amazing stuff. I I was looking at all of your posts. Um, Elliot, um, from the perspective of you playing for three years, so forgive me for being wrong, but I'm really blown away with what you've been doing. Um, have you, Thank you. Have you, Thank you. Have you been able to uh, to hook up with any other uh, stick players in your area? Uh, there is one chap um, who hopefully was going to join us, so um, I don't know if he will. He may be asleep. Um, called Simon Abbott, who's a, a stick player. He's got a, a, a 12... 12 string for Duke, I think he's got. Uh, haven't actually met him yet, hoping to. Um, he, he's actually contacted me because he wants to do like a mini seminar for stick players in WA and for interested people at some point. Um, so he and I are going to talk about that and sort of like have discussions about, you know, what do we discuss as opposed to sort of like turning up and going, well, here's this thing, it makes this noise, any questions? Yeah, so I think we sort of need to formalise it a bit more. Um, certainly, um, there's another chap, Dario, surname escapes me. Um, he's not a stick player yet. I saw him at the uh, the Crimson Project. Uh, so he was another guy with you know no hair and facial hair instead. So sort of, yeah, this always seems to be, with the exception of the wonderfully replete Russell's you know tonsorial splendour. Uh, it seems to be a bit of a thing that you know, male stick players need to be bald with facial hair. Um, <laughs> not, in, not in my case. Well, it's um, a good luck. It's a good luck. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's neat, let's just say that. Uh, but he came to a gig that I was playing at. I was asked to play a couple of tracks on stick for a progressive um, uh, metal band. And he was there and he said, oh, so you, you play Chapman Stick as well? And I said, yeah, yeah, you play. He said, not yet, but I want to. So he was looking at getting a stick as well. He never actually played one or seen one or touched one. That's the trouble with Perth. Perth is on record as being the most isolated capital city on the planet. Right. So consequently, things have a tendency to be you know, far away from us and we get used to things being far away from us. I was astonished to find out that there's about five or six different stick players in in WA, in Western Australia. Um, Simon's the only one I've made contact with. Since then, I've made contact with Conrad. Um, yeah, Scott Conrad Neville, of course, is going to be on next week. Oh, right, excellent. I'll look forward to that. Um, Scott Neville's uh, the chap that I got Colossus from. He's over in Victoria. Uh, mm -hmm. Andy Savanos is in Adelaide. Uh, it's it's really good to see that there's a, you know, they start to come out of the woodwork and that there was actually a site called Australian Stick Collective was you know, encouraging because it's like oh it's not just me because there's <laughs> there's a certain appeal about being the only guy out there who's got one of these things it's like yes you know I, I, that makes me special but um, it's really nice to sort of see that there's other people who have the similar interest it's like you know um, it, it's great to ask them for advice or just you know interest to see what kind of music they're into and certainly like the the overall stick community I mean the fact that something like this exists um, four months ago I didn't even know that, that such a thing was possible um, so to be talking to you know people across the globe about this instrument is uh, quite remarkable it's, uh, yeah the, the stick community overall is pretty is, is a pretty phenomenal and supportive uh, place um, you guys should really yeah. throw a uh, Throw a little uh, potluck dinner and get all of you together because when you can sit down with uh, someone who, <laughs> plays, who plays your instrument, like it's it's an amazing learning experience, and you always you know it's a learning thing that happens both ways. It's a it's incredible. So yeah, looking forward to yeah. hearing all about that. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully we'll get ourselves organised and get something happening before the end of the year. Uh, it just sort of depends on the logistics of it, but I mean. It's, I've got to meet Simon first. I mean, you know, he lives in the same town, but we actually haven't crossed paths yet. So, right. so, so a couple of weeks ago, um, you had mentioned that you were going to go on stage with your stick. Was that the first time that you actually played it in front of anyone in a professional? Capacity? No, uh, that's that was probably about the fourth time uh, that I played in front of an audience. Uh, the first time I played stick in front of an audience, I'd had it for about two weeks. 
Um, and I did that <laughs> deliberately to, it was basically just to sort of uh, A, show off the fact that I had this thing, show off the sound that it made, and also challenge myself to sort of like, get out there and play it. Don't, you know, try and conquer that fear of like, oh, I'll just keep this in my room until I'm good, because otherwise you end up sort of like being like a bedroom shredder. You know, I can play all these fantastic links, but no one can see me do it. It was to break that sort of cycle. So I was just playing something very, very simple, you know, bass-wise, on the stick at the first gig. And of course, it was like, come and see me at my first gig. I was like, break out this horrible instrument that you know people are scared of, namely me. So um, that was good. But yeah, the, the gig that I played recently was far more challenging because the music was far more challenging. It was, um, <laughs> initially, we were going to do Acid Rain by Liquid Tension Experiment. <laughs> uh, we like challenges, uh, but for the uh, we we rehearsed it a couple of times, and we got to the point that's like the day before the gig, where we sort of looked at each other and honestly went, "It's not ready, is it?" And so, how did I describe it? I said, "It's it's you know it's under our fingers, but it's just not under our skin. We just hadn't got it. It was a struggle to play it because it's a phenomenally difficult piece of music." But we had two other pieces of music that we were doing as well, so we just went with those two. So I got to play. Two pieces. Uh, uh, as you know, <laughs> but uh, I, meant, I mean, I made an abominable noise, and but that wasn't necessarily the most important thing. The most important thing was to get out there, conquer that fear of getting out and playing in front of people, and just you know make a note to okay, I made that mistake. I'll make sure to do it better next time, and just approach it from that point of view. And to be honest with you. Nobody in the audience really noticed, and they were too staggered by the fact that I had a, a Chapman stick. And we were... Uh oh, did we lose Elliot? I think I think we did. He just uh, disappeared. Oh no! Um, Damn. Let's, let's let's see if we if if he gets back in, uh, maybe. Yeah, there, was, there was a bit of a stall. Um, I was going to ask him about uh, about uh, whether uh, you know what he thought the uh, the Australian sound was. So I'm hoping we can get him back. Um, oh, it sounds like it sounds like we can. I heard some positive blinking going on. Um, that was me uh, trying to send him a message. I can't tell if he's on or not, though. Okay. Damn. Well, you know, it is the other side of the world, and it's, uh, you know, it's like, um, uh, what is the time there? I have the time in Perth to be... Is it 4 there? 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. Yeah. 4 a.m. So uh, we're looking at, if we can't get him back in the next, uh, within the next minute, then... Oh, oh Elliot yeah. McCann, join the video call! Woohoo! Uh, good. You'll have to be. You'll have to bear with us. Australia only got electricity about 50 years ago. Um, <laughs> my apologies for that. I have no idea. Apparently, the internet disconnected. I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, listen. Just to, just to finish what you were saying before you so rudely were interrupted. Um, yep. uh, you had said that you know uh, you had found that um, when you were on stage. Playing this music, it was cutting in and out. Uh, how was the uh, crowd reacting to, to to the band overall and to the stick? Did you feel like that was uh, something that was a presence on stage? Definitely. Um, they actually sort of made a fairly big deal about the fact that such and such is coming with a Chapman stick, and a lot of people came to see the stick, which was lovely. Uh, we also played to a, a crowd of people that um, were there for a specific reason. So it wasn't just like a, we, because of the nature of the music, it was very um, ornate, very technical music. So fans of that sort of music turned up. So they were, I mean, I think they were surprised to see it. Everybody knew what it was because they were sort of fans of you know, progressive music. Um, so they would have encountered one either through King Crimson or Dream Theater or whoever. Um, yeah. I think they were quite astonished to actually see it in their hometown, and the response was marvellous. They just cool. you know, loved it, so which was uh, really, really nice. And that's actually been the case. I mean, even like the first time I played the instrument at a gig, uh, the sound guy looked at it, and I know that this guy had been—he's been doing sound for 
years and years and years because uh, I'd seen him at gigs before. And uh, so I had my two bases there, and then Claymore comes out. And he's looking at it and going, what's that, mate? So, oh, this is a stick. Oh, what does it do? So it makes a really good noise. <laughs> Check it out. You know, you're going to love this. He's looking. At, oh, that's really, really good. I've never seen one of them before. But like, really, you know, don't you watch videos? So, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's you, so you, you'll either have the response. I mean, the two responses that I get from most people is, "What on earth is that thing?" or "I can't believe you've got one." And depending on those, uh, the next question after either of those things is, "What does it sound like?" It's uh, right. literally the second question is always. What does it say? What kind of a noise does it make? So, there's always a lot of interest in it. Um, people aren't scared of it anymore, which is good. The only person scared of it is me, because I'm the one who has to operate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're the one who knows. Um, listen, uh, we're gonna uh, open it up to uh, Russell, who had a question for you. Our fearless oh, leader at the helm, Russell, <laughs> from Chicago. Hey, Elliot. Um, first off, I'm really impressed with. Uh, not only your progress, but you're just, you know, get out there and do it attitude. That's, that's really cool. You know, great job. Um, Thank you. With, with your musical background, I'm also impressed with your approach, um, which seems to be more play and hear what sounds good and, and duplicate that as, as, as needed. And I was wondering, um, do you have plans to continue doing that, or are you going to try to bring more of that knowledge down to the instrument as far as, you know, these chords, these notes, this is where this is, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, what you've been doing is working, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, it'll probably end up being a mixture of the both. Um, I don't know that I'm going to consciously go, all right, now I know where my A chords are, and therefore it will transition to this D chord. I think that'll just become assimilated uh, knowledge of the instrument, and most of that will come from the experimentation of, well, that worked last time. What's these different chords? You know, um, and also, I suppose it also depends upon the material that I'm doing with it as well. I've not played um, a cover of anything at the moment on stick. Um, it's all been original music that I played, or tell a lie, except for that progressive gig. Um, it's yeah, it's mostly the focus will be, I would assume, on the music that I'm doing with the bands or my own compositions come that time. Um, I have wondered about setting myself the challenge of why don't you learn a piece of music and see if you can play on the stick, but I think I'll wait till I've actually got a better facility. If, you know, give me another three months <laughs> and uh, I'll have, I'll have you know, something down. Uh, what was I working on the other day? I was trying to get Babylon Sisters down, uh, and that was because of all the of parallel fifths at the beginning of it. And I thought, well, I can do that and then just try and work the melody in. But then that sort of like deteriorated into me doing my own thing. So, again, it's a matter of discipline, that wonderful D word. Am I going to be disciplined enough to sit down and actually do the Becker and Fagan thing, or is it going to become a McCann aberration? And usually it becomes a McCann aberration in the end. So. <laughs> well, Hallelujah. That, that, that works, that works. But, you know, as far as covers and stuff go, you could take the approach of, all right, I'm going to know where the notes are, I'm going to, I'm going to read this, or you could just continue yeah. what you're doing and do it by ear. So I, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Not yeah. at all, yeah. I, I would agree, absolutely. I think the two, com the two can complement each other very, very well if you um, sit down and focus on doing that. So, But I still, again, because of where I'm at with the instrument, it's sort of that hasn't been my focus. It's uh, really just been a case of, Learn, not so much maybe learn the notes because it's such a fluid instrument. Um, learning the positions and just getting used to the still I'm still getting used to the physicality of where certain things are, particularly in the left hand. The right hand's coming along quite well. I won't say that it's good. I'll say that it's coming along quite well. But <laughs> getting getting used to the, uh, the the different left hand positions of different notes and. Um, yeah, just getting used to the left hand and getting that, that feeling all right, because you get used to this all the time playing bass. Doing this is a whole other position. First time I started playing this thing when it first arrived, about three days later I started getting shooting pains down my left arm. And, of course, I started thinking, uh-oh, what am I doing? What I was doing, I was playing like this. Sort of like, you know, I'd seen all the photos you know, of people playing that way, and I thought, okay, right, that's the way you play. So, of course, all this strain... And tension. It's like 
my, my muscles were aching because they hadn't been asked to do that before. So it was like, oh, this is interesting. So three days later, I'm like, ow, this is not good. So in the end, I've just learned to relax a bit and sort of watch the way that other people play as opposed to just looking at photos and sort of trying to emulate that. Watching the way people play. Um, Kevin is very, very relaxed when he plays. Um, who's another really good example of a relaxed player? Um, Bob, Bob Colton. So I was watching something of his yesterday. Um, he absolutely shredding something um, from like it must have been like the early '80s. And again, he's just completely and utterly relaxed doing it. So that's something for me to take on board and uh, try to bring into my playing, as well as just actually making sure that my fingers hit the right spot at the same time. So. Right. Yeah. Those are those are all great approaches and great things to keep in mind because there are guidelines for how to hold your hands and, and arms and stuff and uh, and obviously those should be tried and in the end what works for a person you know is, is the cool thing. Um, but uh, yeah, once again, I really dig your approach because um, m my approach is completely opposite and so I'm always enthused about how other people approach things and a lot of times people will be like, oh, I want to see the tab and I want to see this and that and just to pick it up and say. Oh yeah, that sounds good, and do this. Um, that's a cool yeah. approach, and so I hope people listening uh, keep that in mind because people learn in different ways, and you know maybe somebody will try that and go, oh, man, it doesn't work. Or, hey, wow, this is going to save me, you know, some time. Yeah. You know, that three months thing, you know. Oh, and by the way, you asked for three more months. I'll give you six. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I might need it. Well, that's um, you raise a very very good point. One of the things that really does appeal to me about the stick. Is because it is relatively uh, you know, okay. It's forty years old, but it is still a new instrument. Whereas yeah. you know, uh, the electric guitar is derived from an existing form, the stick isn't. Um, so consequently, it doesn't have an ingrained tradition about how you are meant to play the instrument. There isn't that baggage behind it. And in fact, from what I can gather, never having sort of had the discussion with the guy, but even Emmett Chapman seems to actively encourage experimentation on the thing that he designed. And that's really refreshing. So there is no sort of correct way yet to do it. And I don't think there will be because there's too many people. I've seen pictures of people who've restrung it low to high and sort of look at it and go, oh, my instinct is to go, oh, that's wrong. But it's like, no, it's different. It might work absolutely perfectly for this person. So that's, I've always sort of looked at that and that's been very, very encouraging about you know, what you can do on the instrument. There's sort of, there are no rules, which is a yeah, lovely all, thing. It's a really, it's, it's a really good jazz instrument from that point. Sorry? <laughs> Sorry, I said we we're all pioneers. Yeah, exactly. It's um, And to have that uh, mentality actively encouraged by you know, the inventor and the stick community, uh, that's rare, and it's really quite wonderful. I've, I've really enjoyed that side of it quite a lot. It's been very rewarding. So, uh, we're at time. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it back to uh, Russell. But before I do, um, I wanted to ask you. Um, firstly, do you feel that there is a, a distinct Australian sound that that I mean, you've been immersed in Australian culture for so long now. So, do you feel there's an Australian sound? Ooh, that's a really difficult question. Um, there's one developing. Uh, for instance, just recently, um, a preeminent composer in Australia uh, died, a guy called Peter Sculthorpe. And he's uh, pretty much responsible for Australian classical music being out there. And his music has a sort of a distinct harmonic quality, which you could still listen to and go, that's Australian. That's noticeably an Australian sound. Um, a lot of, unfortunately, because of Australia's history, and it's a very young nation, uh, a lot of their history is wedded to the colonial times, so a lot of it will come, it will be Anglo-Saxon, it will come from England. Um, with the cultural invasion of our wonderful American cousins, <laughs> so to speak, we've taken a lot of American culture and assimilated that into our own. What is, an Australian sound is developing. I couldn't tell you what it is right now, but... Um, there, there is certainly one. I mean, for instance, the Perth music scene is very, very vibrant. It's a small, very small city, um, but there's thousands of bands. It seems to be. Uh, I think that what's, what's the general population of Perth? It's around about two million people. It's not big at all. Yet there are several 
high profile bands uh, in Australia starting to break nationally um, and internationally as well, all sort of coming from this little hub scene. So, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are isolated, so we have to make our own little scene. Um, but as far as like a, a, a Perth sound versus a Melbourne sound, don't think that exists yet. It, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it develops, but give us time, you know, we'll get there somehow. Right. right. So, um, uh, future for you, you gigging with Magnolia Jones, are you gigging with the, is it the Jeffersons? Yep, the Jeffersons. Um, and also whoever else needs a stick player. So, <laughs> basically, sort of, I'm not so much throwing myself open saying, yeah, let me be your stick player, but I'm open to take challenges. If anybody asks me to play stick, if I can possibly do it, I'll say yes, because, again, it represents the challenge of, as opposed to me saying, oh, well, I'm not ready to play yet. Make yourself ready. Go out there. Set yourself the challenge. I mean, if I if I can potentially play liquid tension experiment stuff after three months, then you know, the, you know, I'm ready for any kind of challenge. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that lovely note, uh, I'm going to toss it back to Russell. Um, thank you, Elliot, for for staying up so late with a cold, nonetheless. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I've been as soon as I found out that it wasn't three years; it was three months that you've been playing. I'm I'm still just just gobsmacked with, <laughs> with that, and, and you're incredibly talented. So yeah, all the power well, to you. you, man. Thank you for for sharing your stuff with us. An and Russell, pleasure. Back to thank you. you very much for having us. Okay, thank, thanks thanks Dale for doing the interview and. You just stole everything that I was going to say to Elliot. So, you know, should I repeat it now or what? Or just watch the video a second time. <laughs> but seriously, uh, Elliot, it was great having you on and learning about you. Um, as I mentioned, when we started, I was looking for information on you, and I really couldn't find find too much, which made me more uh, even more intrigued. And maybe that was your plan. But be that as it may, <laughs> why don't you put some more stuff on YouTube so people can hear more of what you're doing? Uh, okay. Yeah, and that would be really cool. But thank you very much, and you know, thanks for staying up so late. So. No problems. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you for having me on oh, board. Happy Free Hands Friday, everyone. Tune in next. Happy week. Sticker Saturday. <laughs> there you go. Corrected me. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.